Hebrews. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 4, starting in verse 14. And it sounds like a lot, but we're going to go to chapter 6, verse 12. It's really not a lot. We'll get there, I promise. This morning we're talking about Jesus, the great high priest. The great high priest. So this is from Romans chapter 4, starting in verse 14. Did I say, he, goodness sakes, Hebrews, not Romans, Hebrews chapter 4. <laughs> yeah, Romans is a good book too, but we're not in Romans 4. If you go there, you'll be lost. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 4, uh, starting in verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, Let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Every high priest is selected from among men and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He's able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and who are going astray since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he also has to offer sacrifices for his own sin as well as for the sin of the people. No one takes this honor upon himself. He must be called by God just as Aaron was. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. We'll pause there to talk about this section of scripture. There's a lot in there. (laughs) There's a lot in there. In fact, uh, just like I said from Hebrews chapter 1, we could take this verse by verse, and I think I could have started 10 years ago and preach through verse by verse, and we wouldn't be done yet. So we're not going to go that in depth into verse by verse, but we'll talk about this in chunks. So the author of Hebrews is talking about Jesus and making this metaphor of Jesus being a high priest. Do we remember what our two questions are as we're studying the book of Hebrews? Who is Jesus, and what am I supposed to do about it? Okay, those are our two questions because the, the book of Hebrews is this apologetic about who Jesus is. It's an explanation and an argument for who Christ is and instruction on how we can be obedient in response to what this revelation of, of Christ's identity is. So here we've talked about Jesus, that he's not an angel, right? That he's not just another spiritual being. And then we talked about Jesus, that he's not just another spiritual leader like Moses was. And here, the author of Hebrews is taking a shift, and he's saying Jesus is the great high priest, just as people would have been familiar with someone standing between them and God to offer sacrifices, to offer up prayers and petitions for them, to walk through the ritual of practicing their religion They would have been familiar with that, and the author of Hebrews is using this as an analogy to say, this is the role that Christ plays. So we know he's not an angel. We know he's not just another Moses. Jesus stands in this position, not only as a son of God, the son of God, not only as a spiritual leader, but as the one who is the intermediary between God and man. The one who stands as both perfectly human and perfectly divine. The one who is able to not only 
speak to God on God's level, because who of us could ever do that? But the one who is also able to speak to us on our level. Jesus stands in the middle as one who is not unfamiliar with what it's like to walk in our shoes. This is very comforting to me for a couple of reasons. First of all, it means that just like the writer of Hebrews said, you and I can boldly approach the throne of grace. I wonder if we understand the gravity and the reality of that statement. That when, at the time that this was written, at the time that Jesus came, the Holy of Holies was completely separate. Completely separate. The priests didn't even go in to the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest. Only one day a year. And when he went in, they tied a rope around him and put bells on the hem of his garment so that if he had not taken care of all of his sin before he entered there, if he in some way displeased God while he was in there and was struck dead, they could pull his body out. Serious business. (laughs) When the writer of Hebrews says that you and I can boldly approach the throne of grace. It's amazing. It's miraculous. It's bigger than anything that someone reading those words at this time could have even imagined and understood. It would have been a sacrilegious concept that an ordinary human being could boldly approach God's presence. And it's something that we mention so casually. (laughs) We take it so for granted today, 2,000 years later, that you and I can talk to God without an intermediary. That you and I can boldly approach God's throne. That we would dare to stand in his presence. It's an amazing thing that God has done for us through Christ. The other reason that this makes Such a difference to me is that when we read Jesus' teachings, when we read about what he did, about the people that he interacted with and how he interacted with them, and that he calls us as his disciples to follow him, many times the excuse is, yeah, well, but he was the son of God. (laughs) Of course he did those things. He was the son of God. And we take Jesus out of the human realm and we say, those things that he said to us in the Sermon on the Mount, we don't really, we're not really supposed to do those things. There's a whole school of thought that would argue that Jesus' teachings were to demonstrate how far we fall short, that they were never meant to be followed. But when I read them, I never see Jesus saying that. I see Jesus offering teaching offering commands to his disciples, to those who follow after him, for them to practice them, for them to put them into practice. Jesus' teachings can make us very uncomfortable. (laughs) They make me very uncomfortable. I don't always like them. I don't always like what Jesus has to say because it challenges my flesh, challenges my humanity. It makes me do things that I wouldn't normally do when I'm walking obedience. Because it makes us uncomfortable, sometimes we will flee Jesus' teachings. We're much more comfortable in the Pauline letters because Paul gives us things we could do, right? Like husbands and wives loving and respecting each other. That's good. That's important. Like, you know, children obeying their parents. That's good. That's important. Those are good things. We shouldn't neglect them. But we'd much rather talk about that than talk about loving our enemies. We'd much rather talk about that than loving our neighbors self-sacrificially. We'd much rather talk about that than praying for those who persecute us. These are things that we know. We know that Jesus taught. We know that he taught, love your neighbor as yourself. We know when we read the story that the person he's talking to says, what we say, right? And who is my neighbor? Just who am I supposed to love, Jesus? The person who lives next door? 
the person who goes to my church? No, no that's right. We're supposed to love self-sacrificially. The story that Jesus tells, the one of the good Samaritan, is a story of someone who helps out another person who would never give them the time of day. The Samaritan had no obligation, no social obligation, no cultural obligation, no connection at all whatsoever to the man who was lying on the side of the road, beaten and bloody. No connection. He was not responsible for that man. But he helped him anyways. That man, had the situation been reversed, probably would have walked on by. Jesus says, let your love for your neighbor be like that. Let your love for your neighbor be such that when you see them in need, you help them, and it doesn't matter if you have a social obligation. It doesn't matter if they're part of your family. It doesn't matter if they're part of your cultural group. You see someone in need, you help them. That's love for your neighbor. But we don't want to talk about that. We want to talk about praying with prayers and petitions, with thanksgiving, so we can receive God's peace. That's what we want to talk about. That's important, and we should. But we need to listen first and foremost to what Jesus said. Jesus did not teach these things unaware of our condition. He didn't say them while he was removed somewhere, sitting on a high heavenly throne. He said them as he walked with dirty feet on dusty roads, followed by a group of misfit disciples that were always getting on his nerves. They were. You go back and you read through the Gospels and you see when Jesus goes, oh, how long? How much longer do I have to put up with this? And he knew that what was at the end of his journey was a cross, so that was pretty, uh, pretty vexing, pretty annoying behavior. He's going, let's get there, please. <laughs> Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus also said, love your enemy. And that's even harder. That's even harder. Okay, so I can accept that if somebody in my town of Emporia, Kansas, is in need, I should help them. Regardless of whether I have a connection to them, whether I know them or not, I should help them. Okay? I can accept that. It's hard, but I can accept it. But when Jesus says to love my enemy, really? Surely he doesn't expect us to actually do that. Surely he doesn't expect us to really love them. Like he just wants us to not totally and completely hate them. That's really what he's saying. Except he's not. I don't see Jesus saying, love your enemy. And when I say love your enemy, what I mean is, nope, he doesn't qualify it. We're to love our enemy. This from the man who washed the feet of his betrayer on the night he was betrayed. Jesus knew a thing or two about having enemies. He didn't say it ignorant of how it feels to have someone you love betray you. He didn't say it unaware of what it meant to have someone turn you over to authorities to be beaten and flogged and tortured and put on a cross. He said, love your enemies, and then he loved his enemies. He loved Judas the night that Judas betrayed him. He washed his feet. He served him in the most lowly way possible. Judas is included when it says, and now he showed them the full extent of his love by taking off his outer clothes and putting a towel around his waist, washing their feet. Judas was included when Jesus said to Peter, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. When Jesus washed Judas' feet, it was with love. It was with a sense of inclusion. It was to say to Judas, you belong to me. Even though he knew his heart. 
So when Jesus calls us to love our enemies, it's not from some distant shore where he never experienced pain and betrayal and suffering. It's from that place of identity with who we are because he knew that we needed to be told that. If love for our neighbor, if love for our enemy came naturally, if it came easily, he would not have had to say it. He would not have had to show us how to do it. But he did. And probably the hardest thing, love your neighbor, love your enemy. He said, pray for those who persecute you. And when he said that, he wasn't saying like, and God, please smite them. <laughs> Strike them down. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about praying for their good. He's talking about praying for their blessing. He's talking about praying on their behalf for good things, for godly things, for God's blessings to be on them. That's a hard thing to do. You ever been on the receiving end of persecution? And I don't just mean like because you're a Christian, somebody doesn't like Christians. Have you ever been bullied? Have you ever had somebody just be mean to you for no reason? Jesus said to pray for that person. To pray for them. But Jesus was not a foreigner or a stranger to that concept either. Because we know that as he hung on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. He prayed for their wholeness, the people who hung him on the cross. He prayed for their forgiveness. He prayed for mercy and for grace to pour out into their lives. As he hung, dying on a cross. What's our excuse? <laughs> I've never been on a cross, you. <laughs> I've never been beaten and flogged. I've never been mistreated like that. I find it hard to pray for people who are mean to me. What a silly thing. When Jesus taught these things, he was walking in our shoes. Not far removed from our pain or from our suffering. He's not far removed from any of those things. He walked it for that purpose to say, I have walked it. To know what it was like to live and walk among our flawed fellow human beings. He moved into our neighborhood and he set up his tent next to ours. And God made him the high priest forever. The one who would stand as a mediator between God and man. The one who could express our needs to the Father. The one who could express God's heart to us. The one who can transform us by his spirit. I want to pick up with what the writer of Hebrews says because it's, I think it's really important. <laughs> really important, in chapter 5, verse 11. The author says, We have much to say about this, but it's hard to explain because you are slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instructions about baptisms, laying on of hands, and the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment, and God permitting, we will do so. It's impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, 
who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away, to be brought back to repentance. Because they're, to their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, that produces a crop useful to those whom it is farmed, receives the blessing of God. But the land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are confident of better things in your case, things that accompany salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love that you have shown him as you continue to help his people. We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end in order to make your hope sure. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those things, those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. So we've got the first answer to our question, who is Jesus? Jesus is the great high priest. What am I supposed to do about it? We need to hear. We need to understand. We need to listen and learn. We need to get past the foundational things and walk in righteousness. We need to test and approve what God's will is. Now that's from Romans. Test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And we do that when we present our lives as living sacrifices as living sacrifices. When we walk in righteousness, when we walk with him, when we make a commitment and stand firm, when we ask the Holy Spirit to do his work in us, when we start to develop this fruit of the Spirit, we'll see this progress come. And the writer of Hebrews says that all of these things are remembered by God important because sometimes we feel like we have to always go back to go. I know that when Rich and I were youth leaders in a very strong Wesleyan Holiness Church, our youth would go to camp every year and get resaved. That was very troubling to us <laughs> because these kids, they would go to camp and they would get saved and then they would be on this high and it would go down, 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 down. And then they go back to camp and they get resaved. So they were always, it was like playing Monopoly where they always had to go back to go. And they never would get around the board. We don't have to do that. We don't have to go back to go. When we set our, pe- our feet on the path that God sets in front of us, on the path of righteousness, when we're walking by his side, God didn't forget Even if we fall, even if we stumble, we stand up. God didn't lose our place on the path. He says, come back to my side. Come back to my side and walk with me. When Jesus was talking about this spiritual journey, he said, come and be yoked together with me. It's not something we have to do on our own. I'm so thankful for that. I am so thankful that this is not something I have to do on my own. I don't have to love my neighbor on my own. I don't have to love my enemy on my own. I don't have to pray for my persecutor on my own. And it's a good thing because I would not do it. (laughs) I would not. I would not. I would fall short every time that was left to me. But I can pray like the man who came to Jesus and said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I can come to Jesus and I can say, God, I know you want me to love my neighbor. Love them through me. Help me. I know you want me to love my enemy. Love them through me. Help me. I know you want me to pray for my persecutor. God, pray for them through me. Show me what to pray and how to pray and how to even want to pray for their good. Help me. Jesus is the great high priest. He doesn't leave us on our own. He doesn't leave us to struggle on our own. He knows where we live. He knows what it's like. 
He sympathizes with our weakness. He sees us because he walks with us still. So our answers to our questions are, Jesus is the great high priest. And our response is obedience. Before it was, Jesus isn't an angel. Your response is, listen to him. (laughs) The second one was, Jesus is not just like Moses. He's bigger than a spiritual leader. Sit up and pay attention to what he was teaching. And here the author of Hebrews takes it again and says, Jesus is the great high priest. Walk in righteousness. Walk in obedience. Because it's as we walk, we begin to be confident Confident that at the end of the path lies an eternity in his presence. I'm thankful that we have a great high priest who allows us to walk boldly before the throne of God. One who knew what it was like to live in our neighborhood when he told us to do really hard things. And one who doesn't leave us alone as we choose to follow him and walk in righteousness. We're going to finish our time of worship this morning. Singing